Assalamu alaikum and hello to my non-Muslim viewers. Today we have a very uh, special guest with us. We have uh, Dr. Robert M. Price, uh, who I'm going to be, my friend, Dr. Robert M. Price, I'm going to be giving a brief introduction to right now. Dr. Robert M. Price has two PhDs, uh, one in New Testament theology from Drew University, three master's degrees um, from Gordon Carr. Conwell Theological Seminary, and he has written at least 20 books, uh, some of them being The Amazing Colossal Apostle, uh, The Search for the Historical Paul, uh, The Pre-Nicene New Testament, and Ho The Holy Fable. Bob is, an o Bob is also an outspoken Republican and a Trump supporter, which I am not. Um, him, him and I are uh, big comic book uh, fans and comic book movie fans and science, science fiction fans. Uh, we also like uh, both Marvel and DC, but I personally prefer DC over Marvel. Um, he has done 20 debates with various Christian apologists, including uh, Dr. William Lane Craig, and has also um, recently debated uh, Dr. Bart Ehrman on the historiosity of Jesus. Me and Bob also have something in common. Uh, we both debated James White, but I don't like James White. <laughs> uh, me and Bob are working on a book together called The Bible According to Robert M. Price and Edition Boulan, which should be out in 2020 or something like that. Bob also holds, oh, and we're also working on a podcast called uh, Edition Boulan and Robert M. Price at the Movies. <laughs> so that should, that should also be out uh, soon. Uh, me and Barter, uh, or I'm sorry, me and uh, Robert M. Price also have something in common. We're both friends with uh, Bart Ehrman, uh, he, uh, you know, the author of uh, Misquoting Jesus and Forge and stuff like that. Uh, Bob also has a Patreon account. Uh, what's your Patreon account? Uh, uh, well, I guess it's just, just Robert M. Price. Yeah, right. okay. So it's Patreon slash Robert M. Price. Mm -hmm. Um, or you can uh, search it up on his Facebook or whatever, or search it up on your own. Uh, Bob also hosts the Bible Geek, uh, the Human Bible, uh, and the Love and does Lovecraft Geek podcast, which are all available either on his website or on his Patreon account. So Bob, thanks for uh, thanks for coming out. Oh, my thanks pleasure. For, uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, yeah, so usually when I do these things, um, I usually let. Uh, you know, my, my guests give a brief introduction in their own words uh, about themselves. So why don't you give us a brief introduction to yourself and why you left Christian fundamentalism? Well, as I always like to say, in the style of 50s uh, teenage drive-in monster movies, I was a teenage fundamentalist and uh, derived great uh, pleasure therefrom. I had a good time as a, a Bible-believing fundamentalist, great friends. I don't look back on it as anything I had to escape from, as if I was a member of the People's Temple or something. But um, the love for the Bible and the curiosity about it that you uh, gain as a fundamentalist uh, eventually led me to repudiate fundamentalism because I found that uh, it was hampering and hindering my understanding of the Bible uh, because it put uh, such a theological straitjacket on it that you you couldn't it puts you in the position of uh, saying, well, it seems to mean this, but boy, if it does, the Bible's not inerrant and infallible, so it can't mean that. And uh, I figured, wait a minute, aren't don't we always say that it's the plain sense of the text that is the authoritative one? There's something amiss here, and eventually I just realized that uh, the biblical authority uh, theory just did not answer the facts, and even worse, Worse for me, uh, the apologetics trying to prove that uh, Jesus rose from the dead and that the Gospels were accurate. I, I uh, once placed uh, a lot of emphasis on that, but the more I studied it, uh, the more holes I found in it until I finally decided I, you know, I've just been listening to one side on this. I need to look over the whole landscape. And when I did, I found it was much bigger than I thought. Uh, now, the question of, uh, I'm not a believer in God, but that's a whole different issue to me. That's really more of a philosophical 
whole question. Uh, I mean, there could be, as Benjamin Warfield said, you could have Christianity with no Bible at all, uh, and uh, though it happens we have one, well, that's that's right. Uh, and you could have uh, theism, a belief in God, without any particular religion. So these things are all independent uh, issues, but I, I eventually decided I just can't really uh, buy the notion of a, of a deity uh, either. So I, I remain uh, friendly to uh, religion and religious people, but I'm a kind of a friendly dissenter, you might say, the loyal opposition. Uh, so I don't have a vendetta against religion, etc. My debates are, and my books really are just attempts to set the record straight. Uh, I, I don't debate people on whether God exists. Uh, that's really not what I care about. I, you know, let people believe whatever they decide to believe. It's none of my business. But when certain people pose as experts on the Bible and start giving out basically religious propaganda uh, rather than scholarship, I feel reluctantly I must step into the ring and uh, try to, to get the facts straight. Uh, to no particular end. I don't care what people do with the, the knowledge, but I feel like I need to stand up for consistent and biblical criticism. Well, let's, uh, let's do a quick. Um, okay. So, um, so can you uh, can you give us uh, a little bit about uh, the Christ myth theory? Um, I, I know you and uh, Dr. Richard Carrier, who's also a friend of mine mm -hmm. and a friend of the show. In fact, Richard Carrier was my first guest in episode mm -hmm. one uh, when I you know started doing this. Um, so. Uh, uh, you know, recently we had a panel discussion with uh, uh, Richard, Bob, and me. And that should be out whenever I have the time. Uh, if my work schedule allows, I'll you know I'll edit it and put it on YouTube. But I don't know when I when I can do that. But anyways, you and Richard Carrier are the only two who have PhDs who uh, say that Jesus didn't exist. When almost all scholars, whether liberal or conservative, hold that Jesus existed. Uh, why why do you hold to the Christ myth theory when like barely like hardly any scholars agree with that? Um, well, there are a, a few others. Uh, Thomas L. Thompson, who's an Old Testament scholar and uh, the king of the so-called Old Testament minimalists who thinks that really the whole thing uh, is, is fiction and that neither King David nor Jesus existed uh, he, he would count uh, also Thomas L. Brody uh, it just so happens they're both Thomas L's uh, Brody uh, is a Dominican monk uh, who, uh, who came out as uh, saying he, he just believed there was no historical Jesus. A lot of his work uh, is dedicated to showing that the Gospels are really based on Old Testament stories and rewrites, which I, I've, uh, uh, with acknowledging his work, have, have embraced as well. Uh, and uh, there, there, uh, there may be a couple of others with uh, earned doctorates in that. Uh, but um, the, uh, in the like, let me just go back to Old Testament minimal for a second. It wasn't too long ago that people would defend that there was a historical Abraham and a historical Moses. They, most scholars, including some conservative ones, had uh, given up on the idea of a historical Adam. Uh, if you're uh, a conservative, you'd say it's symbolic. If you're uh, more critical, you'd say it's a myth, but it amounts to the same thing. But um, it, ever since uh, I guess the sometime in the 70s uh, Old Testament scholarship has made a huge change uh, in the direction of what is called minimalism uh, the, uh, the old argument that uh, the Bible is vindicated by archaeology has just collapsed and uh, the absence of evidence of any of the uh, Old Testament and I would even say New Testament stories that has really proven fatal uh, and now uh, the 
rule among Old Testament critics is uh, that the, there was no Abraham, there was no Moses, uh, there was no David, etc. That you, you only pass into history with uh, oh, uh, characters in uh, Second Kings, Omri, and, and so on. Uh, and uh, there you have some history, but most of it is just foundation legends and so on. Well, that didn't take very long for for Old Testament scholars to move toward uh, a heavily mythicist approach. I think the same thing is beginning to happen with the New Testament. In fact, uh, it might even be better to, to call the Christ myth theory a New Testament minimalism because it's the same sort of thing. And um, uh, other minimalist scholars like uh, Philip R. Davies seem to be leaning in that direction. Yeah, why don't we ask the same questions about the Gospels and uh, maybe we should, maybe we are, and um, if that's the case, I would say uh, Richard Carrier, Thomas L. Thompson, Thomas L. Brody, me, and uh, some few others uh, are uh, the vanguard. I, I hate to say stuff like that because it implies I'm um, trying to you know, glorify myself, and that's absurd. But I mean, we we would be the the uh, uh, the first fruits, uh, shall shall I say? And uh, I, I think uh, more and more people will come around to it. But it's going to be slower than in the case of the Old Testament, because people have Christ, most scholars are either influenced by a Christian upbringing or are still are some kind of Christian, and boy, they just can't let go of of some kind of G. Jesus. Uh, so I, I can't help thinking that is one thing that retards the, the progress on this. But um, as to why anybody would become a New Testament minimalist, embrace the Christ in this theory, there's a few important points. One of them, which though striking is probably not the most important is the uh, utter absence of any mention of Jesus in any non-Christian source uh, in the relevant centuries like uh, you you have in the second century somebody like Tacitus who uh, refers to uh, Jesus he's talking about Christianity and he says in case you don't know it was started by one Christus or Crestus depending on which manuscript you read uh, and and uh, who was crucified under the prefect Pontius Pilate. This isn't really helpful to establish the existence uh, of a historical Jesus because whether or not there was one, Tacitus, well, he was in no position to know. He's simply reflecting what Christians say. Like if you knew nothing about Islam and somebody was explaining it to you, they'd say, well, the founder was the prophet Muhammad, etc., etc. Uh, they're, they're telling you what the, the, the Muslim understanding is. They're not really even weighing in on the historicity of it. Uh, or Buddhism, well, it's founded by a guy named Gautama Buddha. Uh, it's just the story, right? And uh, so uh, that's the same with Tacitus. There's a famous passage in the Jewish historian Josephus writing in the 90s AD or CE, if you prefer, uh, where he mentions Jesus. But this passage has really been demonstrated to be a, a, a Christian forgery, an interpolated into the text of Josephus and almost certainly by Eusebius, a 4th century Christian ecclesiastical historian. You know, the, the idea of the, the victors write the history. Well, this was his ecclesiastical history as a kind of a, an, an authorized biography of Christianity. Whenever I hear that, I start to worry. Authorized? Uh, the, the party line. And, and it looks like he created this passage. Uh, Josephus should have mentioned Jesus, so let's say he did. And uh, so th there's no real evidence of Jesus from the time that would be important, namely the ostensible lifetime of Jesus, which would be something like 4 to 6 uh, BC or BCE, uh, all the way up to about 30 uh, CE or AD. 
there, there's just nothing there. Uh, now, why would that be? Uh, well, the, the problem with this is that if Jesus were the miracle working Superman of the Gospels, uh, who finally had to be crucified because he was uh, creating such a stir, why would this not be mentioned? I mean, there are really shrimpy, insignificant messiahs that, that were mentioned, a revolutionary uh, rabble rousers, rebels against Rome. Uh, why would this much, much more spectacular figure earn no place uh, among any kind of known writers and there's, there's really a lot of stuff from that period. Well the uh, answer that uh, mainstream New Testament scholars tend to give is they uh, will say, well, admittedly, the gospel Jesus is the Christ of faith, uh, embellished, uh, blown up from the Jesus of history. And to most people, Jesus would have been known simply as a faith healer and an exorcist, some kind of a sage, or loads of those, or a dime a dozen in, in the ancient world. Uh, and uh, would they have given him any special notice? Well, no. I mean, uh, do you think American history books are going to have a chapter on Oral Roberts or uh, Kenneth Copeland? Uh, highly unlikely. That's superficially plausible, but then you've got to ask, why did Christians make much of this modest and uh, this uh, negligible character. Uh, what? And I like to be in a comic book fan. I like the analogy of saying if somebody wants to determine if there was a historical Superman that came from the planet Krypton with powers beyond those of ordinary mortals and so on. Um, if somebody says, was there a Superman? You know, I bet there was. Uh, wait a minute. Uh, he's only mentioned in comic books. Uh, there's no uh, there's no newspapers with Superman defeats Lex Luthor. Uh, well, and then you whittle him down. You say the historical Superman was a mild-mannered reporter for a great metropolitan newspaper. He was Clark Kent. Uh, and and uh, the faith in him uh, ballooned up into Superman. But then you gotta ask, why? I mean, what's the big deal about Clark Kent? You know, there's there's no Clark Kent comics. There's no uh, action comics featuring Clark Kent, intrepid reporter. It's the same, and, and you know, even saying there was a Clark Kent would simply be a hypothesis. And, and I, that's, that's the problem I have with this. If the historical Jesus didn't merit attention by non-Christians, why did he merit attention among Christians? How did this thing blow up from pretty much nothing? So that is a problem. Uh, now, what about all the miracles and, and so forth and the biggie, the uh, resurrection from the dead? Well, uh, it doesn't get mentioned in sober history, but there are loads of parallels to this in Greco-Roman mystery religions, even in the Old Testament and uh, ancient Near Eastern pre-biblical stories of dying and rising gods and uh, of rituals in which one um, sort of patch oneself into the holy story you baptized your your dying and rising with Christ a lot the Mithraist religion or the religions of Osiris and Hercules they all had such participatory initiation rites they featured dying and rising gods Baal in the Old Testament was one Osiris in Egyptian religion uh, Marduk even so you got to ask yourself if these guys weren't real, why believe that the Christian version was? I mean, it's so similar. Uh, he's put to death by his enemies, um, and even the detail of uh, 
women devotees searching for the body and finding it in post-mortem appearances and all this uh, these are uh, these appear in myths and legends there's no known historical instance of this uh, so to say that yeah yeah Osiris Baal uh, Hercules not that just myths but Jesus it really happened with him to go back to my beloved comics again this sounds to me like somebody saying uh, you Captain Marvel, your Martian Manhunter, your Thor, uh, I mean, these are just fictions, but Superman, now uh, he really existed. Why would you think that? Right? Why? Uh, it's just special pleading. My favorite is the real one. And I, I just, uh, I, uh, this was not an easy conclusion for me to come to. I used to think the Christ myth theory was, was crazy. But then I began to look into it and read the people that uh, made these arguments. And, uh, and I guess the thing that really pushed me over the edge was the work of Brody and others who showed in great detail how virtually every Every story in the Gospels could very plausibly be understood as a rewrite of uh, an Old Testament story about David, Moses, Joshua, Elijah, Elisha. And, and they showed this in terms of uh, the vocabulary. Sometimes uh, the Gospel story even uses the same phraseology as the Greek translation of the Old Testament. And uh, once you uh, discount all of that, uh, you, you don't really have much much of anything left. I mean, that doesn't prove that they were copied from the Old Testament, but it it pretty much vitiates the argument that you can trust those Gospels, you can't. Uh, and uh, of course, I, I'm not attacking the Gospels, right? I love the Gospels. I love the Bible, but uh, I, I feel like that those who defend it as all history, an analogy for this would be, suppose you had a bunch of uh, cultists, whatever, who insisted that the Olympian gods are real and that Achilles was real and uh, one version of his story has him raised from the dead. Suppose somebody said, yeah, hallelujah, praise Zeus and uh, we got to read the Iliad and the Odyssey uh, as literal history because it's divinely inspired, which a lot of the ancients did think. What would classics scholars think of that. Uh, they love the Iliad and the Odyssey or they wouldn't have gone into that business, right? They would be the ones to say, hold on a second. You're getting this totally wrong. Uh, they wouldn't say this because they hated the Homer and the Iliad and the Odyssey. It was it's because they love it. They don't want to see it misconstrued and misrepresented. And that's the way it is with biblical critics generally. And uh, Christ mythicists. I don't know of any of them that hate the Jesus character and hate Christianity. It's just that they love the Bible more and want to see it treated fairly. I, that's the case with me. I finally had to decide uh, do I want to go with honesty about the Bible or faith and I, of course I chose the, the former. And so the, the Christ myth theory is just an extreme example of that. Uh, people don't like the word extreme, I understand, but what I I mean is the the uh, the most consistent uh, approach without uh, pampering it and putting on blinders because you there's a sacred cow there that you want to preserve. You, you can't let preferences like that control it. And I think biblical criticism consistently followed would lead you to mythicism. One last thing, uh, it, it's, it is a theory, right? Uh, the idea that Jesus didn't exist, it's not provable. Uh, I can imagine ways that future dis manuscripts dis discoveries could debunk it. You know, I, I don't think it's a dogma. It, to me, it just seems like uh, the, the theory that makes the most sense of the evidence. Historians are at least not supposed to have dogmatic beliefs. You, you've always got to keep your uh, theorizing probabilistic, provisional, knowing that it might uh, be overturned, and if it does, that's fine. So. Okay, um, see, as 
uh, see, I'm Muslim, and uh, I think you already know that by now. And then, uh, see, in, in Islam, uh, Jesus, is, Jesus is accepted, but he's not like uh, he's not like the Superman. He's like the Clark Kent. So, is it is it is it reasonable? Is it possible to hold the claim that Jesus did exist, but those other supernatural, those other you know those uh, things that would make him Superman, like the resurrection, the uh, ascension, mm. the uh, uh, what you may call the divinity, all that, the Son of God, Trinity, all that. Would you say that that was added later on, and then uh, would it wouldn't it make more sense uh, to put it in my own like analogy, using your analogy? Because uh, Jesus was the Clark Kent, and then eventually he evolved into the Superman. Is that a feasible? Uh, is that a reasonable thesis? Or uh, well, things like that have happened. Uh, in fact, one I do believe there was a historical Jesus. Mm -hmm. So uh, it does. Uh, the the reason I think that. Uh, that has not happened in the case of Jesus, but rather that he began as uh, conceived as a heavenly deity uh, and uh, who never came to earth. And actually, the the progress went in the other direction. He became humanized later. Uh, the reason I think that um, that uh, rather than that he was a historical individual that became a god, much like Ali, uh, the uh, the uh, what was he, the nephew and adopted the fourth caliph of Islam. Yeah, he. There are uh, quasi Muslim sects to this day that believe that he is the incarnation of Allah, or even a member of a trinity of incarnate uh, uh, versions of Allah. Uh, of Allah. Now, we have every reason to believe that Ali existed, and uh, that in his life, one story says that in his own lifetime, people were worshipping him, and that uh, he uh, said, hey, look, I never said this. I don't buy it. And, uh, and he executed somebody that was spreading this heresy, and uh, the others who believed it said, well, who but a god would have the authority to do that. It's just like in Monty Python's Life of Brian. Only the true Messiah denies his divinity. Well, uh, so that can happen, but with Ali and various, uh, Alexander the Great, Julius Caesar, uh, the, the, these people, Cyrus of Persia, they left a, as they like to say today, a footprint in secular history, like Caesar Augustus, also called the Son of God, the Savior, etc., uh, he uh, miraculously born and uh, became a god. Uh, there's th th he is tied up with Roman history. There's there's no way there was no Caesar Augustus. There's no way there was no Cyrus of Persia. Uh, there's just too much uh, that ties him to the historical continuum. Just you know military history, political stuff, uh, and so forth. But with Jesus, there is not now. It, it seems at first that there is because, uh, well, didn't Herod the Great try to kill him? Uh, didn't Pontius Pilate, who was well known to history, uh, didn't he uh, condemn him to death? Uh, didn't Caiaphas, the high priest, condemn him? We, they've even found Caiaphas's tomb. There's no doubt that he existed. Herod Antipas, oh yeah, yeah, he, we know a lot about him. Uh, Archelaus uh, mentioned in Matthew, well, sure, sure, he existed, but scholars long ago with no interest in the Christ myth theory uh, leveled really damning criticisms against those stories taken as history. Uh, the, uh, the attempt of Herod the Great to kill the infant Jesus is, is really um, crisscrossed with improbabilities and, and absurdities actually the the uh, there are two different versions within the nativity story of what the star of Bethlehem is and it's just all kinds of narrative implausibilities like why didn't the angel tell all the other parents in Bethlehem to get their kids out of the way in case of that them it's just you know, paper characters in the story uh, and and the whole thing seems transparently based on this on Josephus version of the nativity of Moses in various details. Uh, well, I guess it could have happened. We know Herod the Great was a paranoid, murdering tyrant. This would have been in character, but 
that points both ways. We have a catalog of his atrocities uh, from ancient writers. This isn't one of them. Um, Caiaphas, uh, there's confusion of the Gospel of John about uh, how long the high priests reign. He has more than one high priest at the same time. The, the trial narrative of Jesus is utterly implausible. He, his capital trial takes place on Passover Eve. This is like uh, the Pope skipping Christmas Eve Mass to attend a, a, a trial. It just wouldn't happen. Uh, and so on. So on Pilate. Pilate, well, I say we know a good bit about him because he outraged Jews every chance he got. Uh, he, he was a, a real anti-Semite. Uh, would he have bent over backwards to try to rescue Jesus from the wrath of the mob and, and, and then found himself unable to? He's, in, he's intimidated by a bunch of pool hall rowdies in the, the, the street. It, it just is, is impossible. Uh, it, it seems utterly uh, implausible as, as history. And so at the very points at which you think Jesus might be attached to secular history, the connections dissolve. They're, they're no less legendary. So there could have been a Jesus, but it just seems to me there is really no solid reason to think so. Uh, and uh, so... Well, my, the my thesis is possible, right? It's, the it's possible. I just yeah. think it's... I find it implausible, but no. it's not absurd. It's I don't absurd. mean to say that. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. So it's not unreasonable to... No, no. That. Okay, so can you give us a few reasons why the New Testament documents are not historically reliable? Uh, Christian fundamentalist, uh, or uh, as Bob would say, I was a teenage fundamentalist. <laughs> Apologists would say that the Gospels and Acts were uh, Greco-Roman biographies, recollected memories, etc. Can you give us uh, some reasons why uh, the New Testament documents, uh, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, etc., are not historically uh, reliable and, uh, you know, fast? Well, one major reason is what Brody and several other scholars say that uh, that it's uh, it, the stories look like rewrites of Old Testament stories, and then you have to ask what is more likely that a man was walking on water, changing uh, water into wine, uh, healing the sick with a word, uh, all this stuff, raising the, the dead or that somebody rewrote a bunch of well-known stories uh, where ancient legendary heroes had done this. Uh, there's no way it's going to be considered more probable that oh, yeah, he raised Lazarus from the dead after four days and uh, he still the storm and all that. Uh, it, it, we weren't there. We don't know what happened. All you can do is to say, what's more probable? Uh, another problem is that uh, the Gospels do not read like eyewitness testimony. And by that I mean, uh, in the ancient world, they knew what uh, what we would call table talk. They knew what that was. Like, we have table talk uh, of Martin Luther. The people that knew him wrote down, yeah, I remember when uh, Martin Luther used to say, I wish people had stopped confusing me with Lex Luther, or whatever, you know. Uh, well, salvation's by grace through faith, you know. And they say, yeah, I'm Luther used to say this and that and the other thing because they were there. Uh, we even have table talk of Hitler. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, or uh, I read a book uh, about um, the uh, impenetrable philosopher uh, of. Uh, well, the process, uh, Whitehead, uh, the process philosopher, uh, by a friend of his, he used to hang around and have dinner discussions with him. Oh, Whitehead used to say this and that, and there's some gems in there. That's not the Gospels. The ancients knew about that, though, because we have a plainly fictitious work from the second century called The Acts of John, which contains a uh, passage or a section called The Preaching of John, where uh, John now aged and a, an apostle is telling his converts, yeah, I remember when Jesus used to do this or say that. When you look at the content, it's, it's obviously fictitious. It's wilder than, than the Gospels. But the point is, that writer knew 
what eyewitness testimony would sound like but the gospels are not like that they're they're short little nuggets little uh, anecdotes and episodes like we find about the greek philosophers and um research into higher education in the hellenistic world shows that students were assigned the the task that they'd be studying uh, socrates or diogenes or whoever and the teacher would say now i want you to write up uh, a little anecdote uh, where the philosopher addresses so and so question to see if you have a good grasp of what he would say. You know, like people say, what would Jesus do? Well, what would uh, Diogenes have said about this, do you think? So uh, students would concoct these things, admittedly fictional. Well, uh, that looks kind of like what the gospel anecdotes are. Uh, and so it's easy to imagine that uh, there are other ways we would have gotten this stuff uh, than, uh, than historical reporting. Or as in Islam, short, fairly shortly after the Prophet, uh, there were uh, scholars who noticed that there were tens of thousands of hadiths, uh, these uh, supposedly oral reports of what the Prophet did and said, which supplemented the Quran. Uh, he's addressing things that don't come up in the Quran. Well, these devout Muslims knew there is no way all of this could go back to the Prophet Muhammad. And so they set up criteria to weed out the fake ones and still came up with thousands of hadith well uh, and and it was even known at the time that uh, in fact there's a I can almost remember the, the wording uh, the uh, there is no circumstance in which a holy man is more likely to lie than in matters of religion and there's even a hadith where uh, Muhammad is made to say that people will be creating these but if they're if they promote piety that's all right uh, and I think the same thing uh, accounts for the Gospels especially when you find that Jesus is made to say three or four different things about fasting now what was he a multiple personality he keep changing in his mind? No, it's obvious that uh, people had their own opinions, and to drive them home, they'd say, well, yeah, this isn't just my opinion. The Son of God said this. And uh, it's there's just too many other possibilities, and the deck is, the deck is stacked against the, the historical accuracy of the Gospels. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, can, can you tell, can you, can we know anything about other figures of Christianity? Uh, did the disciples exist? Uh, you know, Peter, John, uh, James, etc. Uh, you know, and how did their travels of their, uh, tra how did the travels of their deaths get recorded? Because Christian fundamentalists like uh, William Lane Craig, Michael Kona, and, uh, and other uh, uh, Christian fundamentalists would say that, you know, the, the disciples died for their belief in the resurrection. Uh, and, uh, you know, people like Barterman and Richard Carrier have already responded to this argument. But, Bob, what, what are your thoughts on, uh, you know, the, the, the claim of the disciples and, you know, uh, their, their history and stuff? Mm. We know nothing about the, the supposed 12 disciples. The Bible doesn't even tell us hardly a thing. Uh, with uh, James, the uh, the son of Zebedee, he we're told in Acts that he was beheaded. Uh, and yet there's a con, uh, conflicting tradition in Papias that uh, that it was not only um, James but his brother John uh, they were both killed at the same time whereas other Christians say oh no John lived to be a uh, hundred years old and we we hear absolutely nothing about uh, the others with the seeming exception of Peter but Peter appears to be a kind of Dr. Watson figure uh, in Sherlock Holmes you know he does this masterful deduction of who the, the villain is and what happened and 
the so so uh, Arthur Conan Doyle has to explain to the reader uh, how Holmes did this. So he has the, Holmes' sidekick, Doctor Watson, ask for clarification. I say, Holmes, how did you deduce that little Sally was the Shropshire Slasher? And then Holmes is elementary, my dear Watson, and he explains the whole thing for the benefit of the reader. Uh, in Buddhist stories, you have uh, uh, Ananda, the uh, disciple of the Buddha who's a bit uh, thick uh, headed and uh, he will bring up some good idea, he thinks, only to have the Buddha say, uh, no, no, uh, that's not going to work. Uh, this is uh, the way we're going to do it. And Peter is always th the same sort of character. Uh, gee, Lord, uh, how many times must I forgive my brother? What, a, a big seven times? No, uh, no, uh, 70 times seven. A again and again, uh, Peter comes up looking like an idiot because he's supposed to. He's giving Jesus, he's the straight man. Uh, he poses a question for Jesus to answer for the benefit of the reader. Uh, gee, Lord, now what did you mean by that parable? Uh, he said, what, you don't get this parable? How you can understand any of my parables? Okay, here we go. The, the sower is the son of man. and so uh, He's just a, 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 he's like a footnote. Uh, it's like, okay, reader, we know you're wondering about this. Here's Peter's, uh, he's asking your question. And uh, the, uh, which is one big reason Peter looks like such a moron. Uh, and uh, it's not the poor guy's fault. He's just a fictional prop. Now, there, there might have been such a person, but uh, the, the Gospels can't even quite agree on the names of the twelve uh, and uh, some of them sound suspiciously like the the desposunoi the uh, the heirs of Jesus so-called James the just Simon bar Cleophas um, and and so on uh, Judas Thomas and um, so forth Robert Eisenman has come up with what I think is a convincing theory that the original or the earlier group of authorities were the, the so-called brethren of Jesus uh, and that uh, they got um, fictively divided up several of the twelve kind of reduced some of them have the same name even a couple of Simons a couple of Jameses and so on uh, they they are expanded uh, multiplied versions of, of the uh, original uh, pillars as they're called uh, uh, Cephas, uh, James and John but we know nothing about these people and um, even the idea that the, the brethren of Jesus as Carrie and Wells and many others say that is not uh, necessarily a, a, a statement about biological descent uh, and uh, it's there are many options as to what that might be and the path the single passage where James is called the brother of the Lord uh, there's a good argument that that's an interpolation anyway so uh, we really know nothing about them. Now, one weird parallel that might be relevant, Madame Blavatsky, the founder of the Theosophical Society, she claimed to be in touch with the ascended masters, these immortal adepts who lived in the mountains of Tibet. Uh, they've transcended mortality, and she had all sorts of fancy names for them, uh, Kuthumi, Moria El, etc., 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 a bunch of them. Um, research has shown that, uh, and she, oh boy, what a character she was. Uh, she would claim to have revelations from these guys that would f flutter down from a vent in the ceiling. Uh, and she said, oh, here's another revelation. Well, uh, that was hokum, but somebody uh, researched and found out that these guys did actually exist. They were just friends of hers. She just made them into these, uh, gave them these funny names and uh, said that uh, they were immortals in Tibet and so forth. So there was a historical basis, but it, it was totally uh, contrived. In the same way, it's possible that behind the uh, fictive apostles, uh, there were uh, church uh, 
leaders of the second century who uh, uh, tried to associate themselves. As for, for Paul, uh, I think that uh, Hermann Dettering and various others are right that Paul is the same guy also known as Simon Magus, Simon the Sorcerer, uh, because uh, when he is described in the, uh, the Kerygmata Petru, the preachings of Peter, and even in uh, the book of Acts, it's pretty obvious we're talking about Paul under another name. The law is over and uh, salvation is by grace, not by works of the law and so on. Uh, and Peter confronts him much as in uh, the book of Galatians when they tangle at, uh, at Antioch. And uh, I think, yeah, that, that's right, that, uh, that uh, he was known as Paul in some circles and Simon Magus and others. So yeah, I think, and, and Simon is mentioned by Josephus as a kind of Rasputin figure connected to the uh, uh, the Herodians and so forth. And so yeah, I think there was a historical Paul, just that he's he's Simon Magus. Oh, okay, so we don't have any reliable records about them believing the resurrection. And the oh yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the the. Uh, the only reason anybody even thought the the twelve were martyred because Richard Carey said there's nothing in the New Testament that says they died for their belief. That's in right. Their and when you look at the books that say they were, these are wildly unhistorical, fanciful legends uh, where Andrew and Matthias go preach to the cannibals, and uh, Paul is executed by Nero, but then immediately rises from the dead and threatens Nero. You next uh, and just all kinds of crazy uh, fabulous stuff that uh, that is much wilder than anything in the New Testament you're gonna take this as history uh, and even if we knew they were martyred and we don't know that uh, you'd have to ask if they uh, if the Roman inquisitors were in the habit of uh, giving you a chance to recant we don't know that I mean uh, from what we read uh, in in the the sources we have I said uh, I hear you're a Christian come with me uh, we don't know that they uh, they were like you know give my thumb screws now you renounce that Jesus guy right no I'm not gonna do it ouch there's, <laughs> there's no reason to think this happened uh, and so they uh, it's just amazing to me uh, what apologists will resort to Oh, okay. Uh, that brings me to the church fathers. Um, uh, are they, are they, in your opinion, are they reliable, and are they, are as Richard Carrier uh, said, are they too late? Uh, oh yeah, yeah. Then obviously, the if if uh, there was a historicization of an originally mythical Jesus this was well in the in the rear view mirror by the time that the church fathers were writing so that that so just, Christian Christian apologists or fundamentalists would say that uh, the church fathers were like the is not in, in Islamic terms you know in terms of things like the is not of the disciples or, or whatever uh, uh, that's a, a good parallel, but it, again, it cuts both ways because. Uh, oh, I'm sorry for my viewers who don't know what it's not is in Islam. Uh, we have something called it's not it's not as a chain of transmission for hadith. Mm. Hadith were. I like, got it uh, from this guy who yeah, got it from that guy it. who got it from this one. Yeah, uh -huh. it's not where in hadith uh, and hadith are like sayings and actions of the Prophet Muhammad. So, uh, in case you don't know what it's not mm. was, um, but I'm sorry. About yeah, that. that's good. Yeah, yeah. In chronicles, they were used as credentials. Oh. Yeah, this guy has the wherewithal to be a priest because he was descended from from Aaron uh, way back, and they'll give you all the links or the genealogies of Jesus in Matthew, which completely contradict one another and uh, have uh, are stuffed with repetitive. Don't they go all the way names. back to Adam? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Luke's does. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Uh, yeah, and and he's got uh, all kinds of priestly names, mm -hmm. Levitical names in a in a genealogy that is supposed. To trace Jesus back uh, to David, who was uh, from the tribe of Judah, uh, and so the the uh, they claimed like they, they would say, for instance. Uh, 
the church fathers that Irenaeus got this tradition about the writing of the gospels from Papias. Aren't there four gospels because of uh, because of that church father said that there's like four pillars holding the earth? Oh, well, <laughs> yeah, Irenaeus. Now my guess is that he's just looking for a ridiculous rationale yeah. for for excluding the ones he didn't like. But yeah, he said, well, there's four uh, winds, aren't there? Uh, the the cherubim and Ezekiel have four faces, uh, don't they? So there's got to be four gospels and four only. <laughs> Kidding me. Uh, and the same thing with the uh, epistles. Uh, there have to be seven epistles because there are seven at the beginning of the book of Revelation. Sure, sure. And uh, and so they figure, well, there are 13 with Paul's name on it, but if he wrote Hebrews, that would give us two groups of seven. So Paul must have written Hebrews too. Uh, it's, uh, it's just the way the ancients thought uh, just won't hold up uh, <laughs> More. Okay, that that brings me to uh, Paul. Now you're uh, you, you brought up some interesting points about um, in your debate with uh, uh, on Bar uh, with Barterm and on uh, did Jesus exist? You brought up something interesting about uh, Paul's epistles uh, uh, being forgeries and, and stuff like that. Uh, that's the first time I heard about it, mm -hmm. so I didn't. Uh, but the, you know, as time went on, I didn't I didn't do any research on it. Uh, but so can you can you give us some brief uh, thoughts on? Uh, uh, the Pauline epistles, uh, as you say, uh, their forgeries are um, uh, mm. why they're not the reliable. Uh, yeah, uh, one there. There's a bunch of reasons that people just ignore. One of them is that uh, more than once Paul talks about traditions that he has handed on to uh, his churches. But if you think about the imagined, scene, like the authorship of Galatians and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, well, the the thing is, if Paul actually wrote these letters, this is anachronistic. You couldn't really say he had passed on traditions. Rather, that this attests that whoever wrote this attributed certain long-standing traditions to Paul, and now he's claiming to be Paul. It's very much like in Second Peter, where the writer is posing as Simon Peter, says, "We were eyewitnesses," but then later on in the letter, he says. Uh, I know there are people mocking you because the second coming hasn't happened. He says, well, you got to remember, as your apostles foretold this would happen, uh, aren't you supposed to be one of these apostles and you're referring to them as figures of the past? Oh, oops! Uh, it's the same sort of thing there. There are retrospective references, for instance, in 1 Corinthians, where he says, um, Paul, he says, I uh, founded the, uh, the, the Corinthian church and Apollos and Cephas watered it and so on. Uh, each has done his share. This sounds like a guy talking about the labors of figures of the past that are finished uh, and uh, yet it's in the name of Paul uh, that's that's one uh, problem uh, speaking of anachronisms first Thessalonians and Romans both seem to speak first about God having abandoned uh, Jews at least temporarily because they have decisively rejected the gospel Paul if he died in 60 or so couldn't possibly have seen things that way. It was way too early to say Christianity and Judaism had parted ways. Now, I mean, there were still Christians going to synagogue uh, in the 6th century when uh, John Chrysostom told them to cut it out. Uh, and uh, so there's a problem. But then, how do we know God has washed his hands of, of Israel? Uh, something decisive must have happened. Well, it had to be the fall of Jerusalem. But this is like ye over a decade after of the death of Paul uh, and uh, somebody just has gotten it screwed up but another problem is uh, there is a uh, a bunch of places where you have uh, one view uh, in one chapter and in the very next chapter the opposite is argued can women uh, preach and prophesy in church yes they can uh, no they can't uh, is there a secret wisdom that we preach oh no no Oh, it's just Christ crucified, but they, ah, but among the mature we do preach uh, the gnosis unknown to the archons and so on. Should Christians eat meat that has been offered to idols before it was sold in the marketplace? Uh, sure, why not? It's just meat. Don't give it that much thought. But then, oh no, you do that and you'll be like the 
uh, the Israelites at Baal Peor who were all killed by God in the thousands because they had participated in idol worship. <laughs> Which is it? Uh, and uh, it, it just, uh, and that's the worst example because it's such a long letter. And the, but there are similar things in uh, Romans chapters 9 through 11 about how God's plan for Israel. There are like three different positions, cheek by jowl, that don't fit together. And uh, as Von Manen and others pointed out, these, uh, these epistles appear to be patchwork quilts that uh, people have continued to insert their own views alongside ones they didn't agree with. We know there were several different Pauline sects in the early church, various schools of Gnosticism and the Marcionites, and in fact they're the first actual Paulinist Christians we know of. Uh, there's no other records of a church in Corinth and all this stuff that early. The Gnostics are the first to collect and comment on the epistles of Paul, and for my money, uh, they uh, they wrote the core of the epistles, and later on, people kept adding to them, including Catholic Christians, who wrote the pastoral epistles to refute all the others, and so it's, uh, it's it, it just doesn't seem like the same person, Paul or somebody else, wrote all of this. The vocabulary is different uh, here and there. They're, they're major contradictions. Like in Galatians, Paul says, I didn't get my gospel from any human being. Uh, and just a revelation from Christ. But in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, Now let me repeat to you what I learned from those who were apostles before me that Christ died for our sins, raised for the wait a second, this is blatantly contradictory. Which way was it? Uh, it's, you just have different views of, of Paul uh, within the uh, the epistles. So you have Paulinists with competing ideas that all wrote them down and added them to, let me correct this guy's view of Paul. Uh, and uh, if the, I don't think there's any way around that. You, you have to wind up uh, arguing just as ridiculous Ridiculously, as people who say that uh, uh, how many times did Peter deny Jesus because he's speaking to different people when he does it in different gospels well uh, gee to get them all in how about if uh, we say Peter denied Jesus six times or nine times get out of here it says three times they just can't get the story straight uh, and most people realize that's just silly but that's what they do with the Pauline epistle well if he was thinking this he could have said this and then this and they really mean the same thing <laughs> don't just give it up but they really hate uh, saying this about the Pauline epistles because even liberal Protestants like to go with uh, Jesus well who knows what he said but Paul's always been the real bedrock of Christian teaching so what you say he didn't write this oh no they can't afford to admit that Oh, okay. So that brings me to the other point. Um, you said that, you know, Paul, the conversion of Paul is a myth that he, mm -hmm. like Constantine, he might have, like, there's a myth about Constantine's mm -hmm. conversion of Christianity. So they might have, they might both have grown up Christian and later on people made up the stories of mm -hmm. converting to Christianity. Yeah, so can you, so can we know anything about the historical Paul or is it all like murky? Like uh, uh, It's all completely murky. I, I do think that Simon Magus thing is a kind of a tent peg that gives us a but little didn't, bit didn't, of Didn't you say in Romans 16 or something there's hints of Paul being yeah, from a family? Yeah, uh, kinsmen who were in Christ before him. Uh, and uh, that, that seems very strange if you look at Acts where, oh, no, no, his parents had him study with Gamaliel as a rabbinic student. That seems very odd. And the reason I take notice of that is when you look at the uh, stories in Acts, uh, three versions of it, where Paul is converted uh, with this uh, vision of uh, the risen Christ on the road to Damascus, they have startling similarities to the story of of uh, Pentheus's conversion to Dionysus worship after persecuting it in Euripides the Bacchae, which is hundreds of years before uh, Christianity and well known in the Christian era. And uh, chapter 3 of 2nd Maccabees, where Heliodorus, an agent of uh, the Seleucid king, uh, is, is uh, going to sack the treasury of the Jerusalem temple, but is stopped in his tracks by. Uh, 
an angel who knocks him off his horse, blinds him, and when the Jews pray for him, because they don't want to be accused of having uh, attacked him, uh, that he, he recovers and converts to Judaism. I mean, these, and this was a widely known book as well, and uh, it just seems to me transparent that, uh, that the Paul story is modeled on these two well-known stories. Uh, I uh, just, uh, and, and there's no hint of this Damascus Road thing in any Pauline epistle. There are references to visions and uh, uh, have I not seen uh, the Lord and all that, but th there's no account of this and you surely would think there would be when when Paul's apostleship is at stake, like in 2 Corinthians. He says, look, if, if I'm not an apostle to anybody else, I, I certainly am to you. I founded your church. Why wouldn't he have mentioned this incredible thing? And it seems to me uh, Luke just decided, let me come up with something suitably earth-shaking and borrowed it from uh, Euripides and 2 Maccabees. Oh, okay. So wasn't there like a split between Peter and Peterine Christianity and Pauline Christianity, like uh, Paul was preaching to the Gentiles and the disciples mm. were preaching to the Jews, and then uh, Paul and the disciples weren't getting along in theology mm. and they were teaching different things about Jesus and stuff like that. Is that yeah, that comes up in, in uh, uh, 2 Corinthians and, uh, and Galatians, Galatians and Acts. Uh, and uh, what's uh, what's th this was uh, to the then, then Acts, like uh, I'm sorry, like Acts. Uh, uh, later on, she says that yeah, they were preaching the same thing, but Acts is rewriting history. Exactly. So, well put. Uh, yeah. Uh, F. C. Bauer pointed this out. He he said that even in well, that in Acts, he is trying to paper over the chasm, and he says, "Have you ever noticed that every miracle and every feat that Peter does?" Paul also does in Acts. They both heal a lame man. They both raise somebody from the dead. They both have a showdown with a sorcerer. Uh, they both heal in bizarre ways. Peter's shadow, Paul's handkerchief. Uh, they uh, both preach to Gentiles. Uh, they sound the same in their preaching. Uh, and linguistic analysis shows that Luke uh, created all the speeches in Acts as ancient historians did. And he said it's because... Uh, it the the author of Acts is trying to cater to both. You Paulinists out there, I know you think Peter denied Jesus and he's no good, but take a look at this. Uh, you see, uh, he uh, he did all these things that Paul did. You Petrinists out there, I know you hate Paul and you say he persecuted Christians, but take a look at this. All the stuff Peter did, Paul did. How can you deny God is equally at work in both? So it is like a, a reconciliation thing, but if you look at Galatians, and I think uh, first and second Corinthians that's uh, not quite the way it is when Peter uh, Peter uh, comes to or Cephas actually he says who was supposedly the same as Peter though I doubt it uh, Cephas comes to Antioch uh, and uh, goes along with Paul. He eats with the Gentile, uncircumcised Christians, and though Peter is a Jewish, Cephas is a Jewish Christian, and they're Jews and Gentiles in the church. Uh, Peter's easy going about it until certain representatives come from James, the head of the Jerusalem church, and uh, who and they seem to be more sticklers that, hey, uh, you can't eat with those uh, Gentiles. They're Christians, but... Uh, and so he says, oh, uh, uh, James's guys are here. I'll see you later. I'm going to the kosher table. And uh, Paul comes in and says, what do you think you're doing? Uh, a hypocrite uh, and so on. He says, don't we all agree that it's faith in Christ that saves? Uh, if you think you got to be circumcised, you're just negating the whole thing. What's the point of Christ then? And uh, so there's. he says he challenged him publicly. Uh, and he says even Barnabas was carried away with this pretense. Well, uh, we don't see any of that uh, in Acts. Though... Uh, well, then he says that in Galatians that he and Barnabas had gone to Jerusalem previously to uh, consult with uh, the pillars, the, the Jewish apostles, and uh, that uh, they agreed that 
okay, Gentiles uh, don't have to get uh, circumcised, keep the Torah, but you deal with them, we'll deal with Jews. Okay, uh, well that's automatically suspicious, like you're dividing up the world mission between two gods. Anyway, um, and he says they gave Barnabas and me the right hand of fellowship with the stipulation that we collect money for the Jerusalem church because we've got a bigger clientele. So uh, we'll set up your Patreon account and get the donations to the church. Uh, and then in Romans, he says, well, I'm going to take that collection to the Jerusalem saints. Pray with me that they'll find it acceptable. Huh? Well, this seems to reflect the, the fact that, as we can see right around the corner between the lines in Acts, that uh, when Paul brought a uh, contribution, they threw it right back at him, and uh, the things didn't stay reconciled. And th this is what we see in the Simon Mega story in Acts. Simon is Paul, and he sees Peter dispensing the Holy Spirit by the laying on of hands, and he says, gee, I'd like to be able to do that. Uh, here's a few bucks if you could teach me how, because he thinks it's a magic trick. And he says, uh, Peter says to Simon, uh, literally, to hell with you and your money. May your money perish with you that you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. Uh, you have neither heart nor lot in this ministry uh, and uh, I can see you in hell right now etc etc well Bauer pointed out doesn't this sound familiar isn't this really a version of Paul trying to buy apostolic credentials by saying look I got plenty of people I can raise money for you and, oh, okay in that case he says surely this is what Luke has done with the story of what really happened so you you can pretty easily see there's this huge strife between these groups and and, and a lame attempt in later years once it was all a moot point to try to paper over oh no no Christians always got along hunky dory everything was fine but it wasn't and there's even uh, evidence of Jewish Christian factional strife followers of James versus followers of Peter and uh, many different uh, Hellenistic Pauline uh, sects and uh, and, and that's why Eusebius wrote his ecclesiastical history in the fourth century to iron out all the stuff of uh, the subsequent strife uh, it's so fascinating oh, okay so acts is uh acts is for lack of a better term full of shit right it's it's, it's just uh it's contradicting paul's uh, uh yeah paul sounds he paul is now a pharisee who keeps the law still uh what i mean that that's even in philippians and uh, i think second corinthians where he says well i used to be a pharisee and i used to keep the law but now i'm freed from that in christ what uh <laughs> just uh, you're just not getting any straight story. Oh, okay. Okay, uh. Bold salad from Master Price. Okay, now, now we're going to move on to uh, Bart Ehrman. Uh, I'm, me and Bob have something in common. We're both uh, we're both friends with Bart Ehrman. We both get along great with Bart Ehrman. And both devilishly handsome. <laughs> well, me, me and Ehrman? Or me and Ehrman. <laughs> okay, so, uh, Bart, uh, yeah, you're, what, what, were your, uh, what are your thoughts on Bart Ehrman's books? Because I know you have good things to say about forgery mm -hmm. and, and uh, Jesus Interrupted and uh, misquoting Jesus and stuff like that. But the the problem was with did Jesus exist mm. um, that book and uh, your thoughts on the uh, the debate you recently had was it in October 2016 I think yeah that's okay right. October so. 2016 it's on the internet it's a uh, Bart Ehrman versus Robert M Price did Jesus exist so if you want to look that up on YouTube or, or on Bart Ehrman's blog or whatever so yeah your thoughts on Bart Ehrman um, are you still in contact with them mm. uh, would you do another debate with them would you work with them again and uh, uh, oh, oh wait, all right, that's right. Bob is writing a book called Bart Ehrman Interpreted uh, that's coming out in April this year, and it's already on Amazon for pre-order, so I highly recommend it. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, your thoughts on Bart Ehrman? And well, I like him very much. We're friends, uh, and uh, he's, a, he's a fine guy. Uh, I 
he, uh, like me, began his uh, biblical study as an evangelical, a conservative, and uh, gradually found himself unable to affirm that anymore, a very similar path. But I have the impression, and, and I am no mind reader, I, it's just my impression that he is still thinking inside the, the box of evangelical apologetics his uh, mentor the great uh, Bruce Metzger who I had a, the privilege of having a class at, with at Princeton uh, he, he they're both textual critics uh, the, the Bard and uh, Metzger and um, Metzger was also something of an apologist and wrote an article where he gives the standard account that uh, the uh, other dying and rising gods were post-Jesus, which is demonstrably not the case, but it was the standard apologetic line. And it seems to me that uh, some of these elements linger in Barth's work, uh, certain uh, axioms uh, of conservative traditional scholarship, uh, such as the idea that uh, Paul at least wrote the lucky seven epistles, as I uh, call them, uh, that uh, he wrote First and Second Corinthians, Romans, Galatians, uh, First Thessalonians, Philemon, uh, left some oh Philippians, and uh, I, to my satisfaction, F. C. Bauer back in the 19th century demonstrated that uh, Paul couldn't have written any more than uh, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, most of Romans and Galatians. Uh, so I, even Bultmann, supposedly so critical, uh, backslid to the seven uh, for after Bauer and argued it was four. But I also find convincing the Dutch radical scholars like W.C. van Manen who argued that uh, Paul, if you use the same criteria, you can show that uh, Paul couldn't have written even the four Hauptbriefe, the four principal epistles. And uh, I'm, this is just not on Bart's radar. I, I was in the West Star Institute's Paul seminar and uh, my uh, mentor and colleague Daryl Dowdy and I were talking about this Dutch radical thing. Even the supposedly super critical uh, Jesus seminar people practically laughed us out of the room. Uh, and it's just so alien because uh, Protestant theology of all stripes really depends on Paul more than Jesus. So Paul is the sacred Ark of the Covenant and anybody that uh, dares touch it winds up in the ditch like a uh, Uza in Second uh, Samuel, uh, and uh, so I found it difficult to uh, to debate with Bart because there is so little common ground. I, I'm operating in a totally different paradigm. Uh, like he actually started laughing when I said Paul didn't write Galatians, though this is an old view. Rudolf Steck, the teacher of Karl Bart, believed this. It's been argued a long time, but it's just shoved out of consideration in any seminaries or grad schools uh, and uh, the he, he readily dismisses the Christ myth theory because he lumps all of the mythicist scholars together and picks out things that he thinks are demonstrably false without I think adequately taking it into consideration like I had the impression he hadn't really read uh, the, the the books of mine or Doherty's uh, Brody's various others uh, Frank Zindler because he didn't seem to be acquainted with uh, enough of it to be able to address it uh, my um, uh, my uh, opening statement in that debate was uh, a response point by point to his major argument in did Jesus exist uh, and uh, yet he just he didn't address uh, some of my criticisms such as that his approach is often circular he'll say that there were a typical evangelical apologetic there wouldn't have been enough time uh, between Jesus and the Gospels for Jesus to become mythicized and, and it seems obvious to me that that applies I think it's wrong anyway but 
the apologists that say that mean that well of course there was a historical Jesus but he couldn't have been embellished into a miracle worker in this brief time several decades uh, between Jesus and the writing of the Gospels that's not the point in our debate the question is was there a historical Jesus at the beginning of Christianity and if you say no Jesus is a sort of distillation of various mystery cult myths and so on when do you even say it started uh, there's no birth date of an individual uh, if the whole thing is if the whole thing is mythical it's it's it makes no sense to say well from the starting point to the Gospels not enough time what's the starting point uh, the Osiris cult uh, it's just like uh, well at any rate uh, he uh, has uh, certain ideas like uh, no one would make up the notion of a crucified messiah it must have been uh, something forced on the Christians they their their messiah Jesus was crucified whoops uh, what sense can we make of this well maybe it was a redemptive death but this was on heard of in Jewish messianism Bart and apologists say I, I think it is not at all because Jewish messianism comes from the sacred king mythology uh, in the in, in ancient Israel uh, that is on display throughout the Old Testament and the, the king was the son of God or the God incarnate the vicar of God on earth and uh, he underwent ritual humiliation a symbolic death of resurrection every year as the kings of Babylon and uh, Canaan city-states did uh, to renew the vegetation uh, and uh, th so the idea of a messianic divine king suffering dying and rising to redeem uh, the world this is a very ancient idea uh, it wasn't something early Christians cooked up and, and uh, this I know from reading uh, a bunch of the Scandinavian myth and ritual scholars Mo Winkle, Gunko, Engnell, uh, Geo Wiedengren uh, but I don't see any airplay of that stuff in uh, did Jesus exist so it just seems to me he's within an apologetic box still uh, and um, that's easy to understand uh, but uh, I think that if you consider a wider range of sources and get rid of this circularity uh, or and the uh, the consensus fallacy I think that is to be found all over the place uh, in uh, in his work unfortunately perhaps I'm misunderstanding it but most people seem to think so that he says well look most scholars think this is wrong uh, the consensus of scholars all the the, the, uh, the in crowd of the society of biblical literature the consensus of scholars is that there was a historical Jesus if you don't think so he must be a nut a conspiracy theorist uh, uh, you know 9-11 truth or holocaust denier uh, all this stuff well I always like to say you know the consensus of scholars in the gospels was that Jesus should be put to death uh, you know were they right uh, it's uh, it, you can't take a nose count as as Francis Schaeffer used to say it, it really does not matter epistemologically what most people think I mean was the earth flat when most people thought so uh, and uh, this is what happens in the succession of paradigms in science in literary studies in history you have a paradigm a framework for interpreting the evidence and uh, if you can make sense of the evidence but there's always data that doesn't quite fit and so eventually someone will start with that data construct a new framework a new way to interpret the data and if it's cogent gradually everybody will come around to it but it's going to be a tough fight as it should be because you have really got to prove your point uh, it's not easy so there's uh, whenever a new paradigm replaces an old one as in old Testament minimalism it's going to be a long fight but the minority view may become the majority view uh, I won't live long enough to see that happen and I don't really care if it happens uh, you know, I'm not uh, part of some Jesus mythicist sect I you know I don't care it's just a, a theory I, that makes the most sense to me oh okay so um, 
Yeah, well, uh, see, I, I like Barnerman's books, Forged and, and stuff like that. But oh uh, yeah, he's uh, done some goodies. Yeah, okay, so uh, what, can you give, briefly give us your your criticism of uh, Did Jesus Exist? Because you and Richard Carrier said that that, that book sucks. So. Yeah. Well, uh, despite the well, there's the differences I, I just outlined, which are more and basic principle. But it does seem to me that he does not accurately represent. The, the views of, of myself and Earl Doherty, who's written some great stuff on this, uh, Acharya S., uh, Dorothy Murdoch. Uh, she, I've written a real damning critique of her, but she's changed her. Uh, she changed her stripes since then and took the criticisms to heart and has written much better stuff. But he uh, blasts us and, and assumes we're sort of like the old parable of a laundryman who uh, make their living doing each other's wash. Uh, he, uh, he doesn't distinguish sufficiently between the very different approaches that some of us take and uh, he doesn't seem to get what, uh, what we're saying uh, and I don't know why that is. Like he says that I use the criteria of dissimilarity to show that Jesus most likely didn't say this or that. He says, well, you know, the criterion of dissimilarity is aimed at finding what Jesus did say, not what he didn't. Uh, it's really two ways of saying the same thing. And I, I was amazed he, he uh, inferred that. And he claims uh, that uh, this very strange statue in the Vatican that uh, Acharya mentions is sort of this it's an odd thing that shows weird things were going on back then in, in religion that had just been ignored. Uh, he says she made this up, only she didn't, uh, and she documented it and so on. And uh, uh, he, uh, Earl Doherty, he, he doesn't get Earl's point, which is pretty clear, I think. So my guess is that his research assistants uh, failed him. Uh, many uh, faculty at you know, highfalutin schools have uh, research assistants, which is how you can do so many books. Like uh, Bart really churns them out, and they're like uh, the forgery and counterforgery, exhaustive in its treatment. Uh, Jesus before the Gospels does all kinds of stuff with oral tradition theories. Great research, uh, really good stuff. Uh, my favorite of his books, uh, The Orthodox Corruption of Scriptures, based on a whole lot of research. And that's not shameful. I mean, you, you have these uh, these Santa's elves working for you, doing research you don't have time to do. They just say, okay, here's some relevant stuff we've culled. And uh, Joachim Jeremias did that. A lot of scholars do that. There's nothing discreditable about that. But I'm, So my criticism is more of his research assistants who rounded up material they thought he should read to critique. But uh, it was wasn't enough stuff. It wasn't in context, and I think it misrepresents us. Um, but um, not in everything he says, of course. But that's the impression I was left with. I was sort of uh, astonished. Oh, okay. He's so brilliant and does so many great books. This just did not seem to me to be an adequate treatment. I hope he does another book on uh, mythicism and uh, does a, a more comprehensive uh, criticism of it. Do you think he has an emotional stake in it because uh, uh, on Jesus exists because most of his work in his career revolve around historical Jesus. So do you think he has like uh, an emotional investment in in the history of Jesus and things like that. Uh, well, um, yeah. Like, uh, for instance, uh, Gerd Ludemann got into considerable trouble for his critical work on Jesus, though he does believe there was a historical Jesus. But I, I know for a fact he had a kind of nostalgic, sentimental attachment to the gospel of Jesus. And uh, even though he's kind of agnostic, he still kind of wishes there was this... Uh, canonical Jesus. Well, it might be that Bard feels that way, but I, I doubt it. I think he's pretty much resigned himself to agnosticism and atheism. But the historical Jesus thing, it wouldn't surprise me. Like, I think it's just very difficult for him to even entertain that as a plausible thing. And, and I think 
my guess, like I'm no mind reader, but but I wonder if it's what Peter Berger calls a plausibility structure. The what seems plausible to your peer group automatically seems plausible to you, or you start looking for another peer group. And Bart defines professional New Testament scholarship as a guild of people that reject uh, the Christ myth theory. I mean, many other things too, but for him, it, it's uh, not, it's automatically fringe crackpot scholarship. And so he, he cannot, because everybody thinks so. Uh, he knows that if he were to espouse this, his colleagues say, uh, what's happened to you? you know, what, what uh, you having a breakdown or something? And I, I don't think he consciously figures, I don't dare take this seriously or I'm out of a job. I, I really don't think that. Uh, but I, I suspect it's the plausibility structure thing. Well, I know that's not uh, sound scholarship. Why bother with it? Um, and uh, it's just uh, an disinclination to think out of the box. I, I'm, uh, I, I have respect for him, so I don't attribute any kind of neurotic or, or uh, disingenuous uh, motives. I, I really no, he, don't. He's so a, I don't, he's, a good, he's a good guy. Yeah, and, uh, and I, I know I sound like I'm undermining him, trying to psychoanalyze him. I'm not. It's just that I, I respect him so much, I need to come up with some explanation as to why I think he's wrong on this. But that's all it is. It's just uh, my it's, guess and understanding. It's just a scholarly uh, uh, disagreement on things. Yeah. Oh, okay. And it's, it's a surprising one. So I wonder, well, how that happened? But that's really the only state is a lot of sad. I uh, certainly don't know. Yeah, I mean, uh, I get along with them, you get along mm. with them. Yeah, so it's just we can have our disagreements. Well, I tell you what it's kind of like is my political disagreement, where uh, there are loads of people I love and respect that uh, voted for a candidate that I cannot imagine voting for. It We're utterly mystifies me. But they're intelligent people, so I said, well, who cares, really? Yeah, we're going to talk about politics in a little bit. Okay, so is there, final question on religion, is there a dangerous way to look at the world through the Bible that may harm societies or societies like racism, anti-Islamic mindsets, Islamophobia, etc., etc.? Is there a dangerous way to uh, look at the world through the Bible that may harm society or societies? Well, the only thing I know of that you could say actually is based on the Bible would be Christian Reconstructionism, also known as Dominionism. I guess they're slightly different things. Uh, but uh, Rusas John Rush Dooney, who was a, uh, I think, a friend of Cornelius Van Til, he's a particular kind of Calvinist philosopher, he argued in a book called Institutes of Biblical Law followed by Gary North with a book called Theonomy and various others. He argued that the law, the civil law of the Old Testament is not negated by the new covenant in Christ and, uh, the, and the United States should adopt biblical law. Uh, he's, he says uh, for this to happen you would have to convince enough Americans to vote it into being. He, he doesn't, he's not for some theocratic, he wasn't a, for any kind of theocratic takeover. So the guy wasn't a fanatic, but he had this, I think, sophistic uh, uh, worldview based on the, the Bible, like stoning adulterers and homosexuals and all that. It, to me, you know, one of my favorite uh, theologians, Bug, Bunny put it well when he said, Yeah, I made a wrong point in Albuquerque. Uh, Rush, Rush Dooney made a wrong turn somewhere. If you're coming up with a few that says you've got to stone gays and adulterers to death, <laughs> look, buddy, this can't be right. There's a miscalculation zone. Uh, but that's the closest thing to someone actually trying to apply alien ethics from the Bible to modern life. And if it ever happened, that would be very bad. It'd be like Christian Taliban. 
but uh, I don't, it's impossible. It's never going to happen. And, and most fundamentalists who know about this reject it. Uh, Norman Geisler, Charles Coles, and they all know oh, these people are fanatics. Uh, so I don't think there's a whole lot of danger. There are weird fringe groups, uh, like there's a kind of uh, Christian equivalent to ISIS in Latin America, where they commit crimes against unbelievers who don't count. Uh, and uh, that's crazy. I mean, I just don't think you can find that uh, in the Bible. Uh, and uh, they're the Christian identity nuts uh, with this racist mythology they, that they ultimately got from Nazis. And, uh, you know, people like to say, oh, I don't like these guys, they're Nazis. I mean, these guys actually were dependent on the Nazi. Uh, so, uh, and, and in terms of Islamophobia, I find that really puzzling and unhelpful insofar as people don't understand about Islam and uh, sloppily group all Muslims together, which yeah. they would never do with Christians, for yeah. instance. That, all right, that's Islamophobia, phobia meaning an irrational fear. But if you don't uh, garble the whole thing and you say, gee, we ought to take precautions against terrorists who may smuggle themselves in among the legitimate immigrants from uh, Middle Eastern countries, that's no phobia. That, I mean, you can debate whether it's a wise policy or not, but that's, that's just prudential regrettable um, scrutiny you're having to uh, to, to exercise uh, but even that has little necessarily to do with Islam which is really a whole different thing I, I mean I think some of the the Sharia law is based on ancient Arabic culture even tribal mores and all of that but uh, uh, I've studied Islam in detail for years. I've read the Quran uh, in four different translations, the whole thing, and tend to read it more. I, I love and am fascinated by Islam, but I really uh, have a great distaste for terrorists who happen to be Islam, uh, Islamic. And of course, the two are not simply equivalent. You can find murderous fanatics of no religion or of different religions. So, so, so the problems not with Islam, the problems with Muslims, or the problems not with Christianity, the problems with Christians, and so because Christianity also has a bloody history. Of yeah, Christians have a bloody history of you yes, know, genocide, does. racism. Uh, mm. You know uh, what else? Uh, you know the Crusades. All mm. there's, there's all kinds of bloody history in in in, in Christian history. So, would you mm. say the problem? with Christians and Muslims or does does Christianity and Islam bring that out in people or well, uh, Stalinism was at least as bad, and that was uh, atheistic. I, I, this crazy thing where some atheists uh, say that religion is the problem, religion is a deadly virus, come off it. I mean, there, there are things like opposing science, yeah, that comes from it. But even there, in the Soviet Union, they, they fostered Lysenkoism because it was more uh, favorable to, or more analogous to socialism. Well, that was imposing dogma on science. It's just, this is the the, the, the foibles of uh, stupid humans. Uh, I, I mean, all of these things, really, uh, Protestant Catholic strike. Is there anything in Protestantism or Catholicism that would uh, naturally result in this? It's just people, uh, or a lot of people are stupid or immature or vicious, and religion becomes a flag for that. Oh, okay, so the problem's not with Christianity, it's not the problem's with Christians and Muslims, so okay, I get it. Um, is there is there a worse is there like a worse Christian fundamentalist you had to deal with? Uh, because the worst Christian fundamentalist I had to deal with was probably uh, probably James White. He's just uh, he's just a nasty old prick. But is there a, is there a, is there like a worse Christian fundamentalist you had to deal with? Well, with James White, I debated him, and I I got along great with yeah, him. I'm I, sorry I, you I had him. Like, me and Barterman, we don't like him. <laughs> I know. I, I was lucky to have a real pleasant, friendly interchange with him. He's a nasty but, old prick. He's a nasty old prick. <laughs> I found William Lane Craig, though personable, uh, he struck me as sort of a used car salesman, uh, that uh, I thought he was uh, using 
cheap debating stunts misrepresenting me and then I correct it and then he gives the same misrepresentation back and he, didn't you say he's like a used car salesman yeah yeah that he's uh, it just seems oily to me and uh, that he he's just giving a like Dwayne Gish always did this this creationist he'd be soundly refuted in debate after debate and wouldn't change a thing. He just kept selling the same, like Jehovah's Witnesses at your door. Good luck having a dialogue with them. Mormons, yes, they'll actually discuss things with you, but Jehovah's Witnesses apparently are told you just get out there and sell those brushes like a fuller brush. And uh, they got a lot of guts. I admire them for that, but that's kind of what some of these apologists are like. There's no way they're going to consider or any other uh, other perspective uh, okay uh, because uh, I think you and Richard Carrier have something in common you both debated uh, William Lane Craig mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, Richard, we were. T I was talking about this with Richard because Richard was. Uh, he came on my show uh, back in October 2016. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, October 2016. He was saying that William Lane Craig's like a like a douchebag on stage. And no, uh, he said that uh, William Lane Craig's like a very fake person. Like like there's a mask. Like you don't mm. know. You're not talking to the real person. Do you have that same? Yeah, I'd, I'd say so. He's like uh, he's got a persona. He's a very fake person. That's what character you're saying is that is I, I hate that? to say it but I, I got that impression you also. Think, you, you see that too yeah it seemed to me that I mean there are other people where they'll say things I'm very surprised to hear but I don't doubt for a second that this is their true opinion and they don't mind being vulnerable about it but he just strikes me as like a political spin doctor I guess that would be an even better comparison oh. but you listen no matter who what candidate what public figure when they have spin doctors well I know my candidate lost the election but if you look at it this way he really won uh, Huh? Uh, and, and you look at the different shows, they're talking about the same events, but they you'd never guess they were, they were the same event. The, the coverage is so different. And I'd say that apologists are essentially spin doctors, but with Craig, it's it's especially egregious. Oh, okay. Uh, I forgot to mention about, uh, can you tell us the problems with the Old Testament, why the Old Testament uh, books like the book of Genesis, uh, uh, you know, Exodus, and uh, you know the uh, kings and all that uh, the patriarchal stories and the David and Solomon story and uh, uh, why the Old Testament in general is not historically reliable mm. and uh, things like that because fundamentals will say yeah there's archaeological things proving the Old Testament so mm. uh, you know well there's uh, some of it is so obviously mythic like uh, Adam and Eve and Noah and the ark that uh, you, you really uh, I don't know how people can defend that as history with a straight face that's just uh, I remember one Southern Baptist guy a uh, seminary administrator uh, said uh, something like I don't know how a man can be in the ministry if he doesn't believe in a literal Adam and Eve and I thought I don't know how you can uh, not be in the insane asylum if you do uh, it just doesn't work and it's pathetic to see people try to rationalize it and harmonize it with paleontology uh, my friend Ed Sawoman and, and I wrote a book called Evolving Out of Eden Christian Responses to evolution and we deal with all that stuff not just the raw fundies with the creationism but the theistic evolutionists who are more sophisticated and try to put a good face on it forget it it doesn't work but so that stuff's obviously myth and the, don't get me started on Noah's Ark the absurdities of that but of course a lot of the Old Testament is not like that and and it's apparent history uh, with uh, Joshua and David I mean people have visions of God but of course people still do whatever it is uh, hallucinations I don't know but that's not implausible but the problem is that uh, you're you're reading anecdotes of what happens to individuals in private that nobody would have known to pass on. Uh, David said this, Bathsheba said that, Abraham said this, uh, Sarah answered that. Uh, who, who could have kept the, these private conversations alive in memory? It's, it's just ridiculous. As Hermann Gokul once pointed out, you're telling me that uh, Israelites were in Egypt for four centuries 
centuries and nothing is recorded about what happened but with Abraham and Sarah who allegedly lived before then we actually hear the dialogue they had over whether or not to kick out Agar it's absurd it's novelistic and uh, that's one of the big differences between uh, fiction writing and history and it's obviously novelistic so that's a huge problem but, but maybe the death blow is this archaeology thing uh, William F. Albright who was a Presbyterian and, and uh, trying to prove that the Bible was essentially historical he played a kind of pin the tail on the Bible game he, is, uh, he and his uh, students would uh, do archaeological digs and if they found something that might have been a biblical location okay that's what it is um, there's a uh, the ruins of a city under the Dead Sea gotta be Sodom and Gomorrah uh, without any real evidence I mean occasionally they actually have found one of these towns with a, its name on something but on the whole no uh, and they just oh this ought to be this this ought to be that like uh, Constantine's mother sending people to the Holy Land to find the, the true tomb of Jesus the true cross and all this stuff how, how could you possibly tell after 300 years? Well, they couldn't and they didn't. They just, oh, here's a tomb. I guess this was it. Uh, and that's why there's more than one Golgotha, more than one tomb and all that. That's what Albright was essentially doing. And that's why apologists felt entitled to say the Bible's historicity had been vindicated by archaeology, but it had. And now uh, the methodology is different. Those assumptions are not there. And uh, so today's archaeologists have rendered just the opposite verdict like there was no great city of Jerusalem there was no royal palace of David there was no temple of Solomon because uh, you can tell whether there, I mean there would be ruins uh, and there are not and uh, what what happened did did God send angels down with vacuum cleaners as if they were cleaning up a ticker tape parade in a on a city street uh, it, it's just ridiculous uh, there's there can't have been such a thing there was no no exodus because we have the technology through uh, infrared uh, detection to uncover old caravan routes through the Sinai Desert but there is no sign of an exodus from Egypt no matter which hypothetical route you pick uh, a transition of millions of people and huge herds of cattle no evidence there'd be loads of evidence if it happened it simply didn't there was no conquest of Canaan you would find all kinds of ruined cities you don't uh, it just didn't happen and so archaeology has put Christians in the same boat it has Mormons because uh, they've uh, there are all kinds of statements about Nephite and Lamanite cities and armor and so on where like there's no vestige of it and so they've uh, and of course they were really finished off by genetic testing that showed that American Indians have no Semitic or Near Eastern um, genes so uh, so much for that I and mean, that blows the whole thing out of the water and so that's the the uh, the uh, like Solomon may have been based on Alexander the Great uh, he has a great empire he dies and and it's divided into the more than one kingdom after he does uh, who knows but it looks like the Old Testament may be written much much later uh, than we thought uh, in, in maybe not just a century before the New Testament it's uh, shocking the the re-examinations that are going on uh, so there's no way uh, there's no way to prove that you know Adam Eve uh, David Abraham Isaac Ishmael uh, all those Old Testament figures, those major ones, David, Solomon, mm -hmm. and those minor ones like, uh, uh, what's his name, uh, Joshua, and uh, 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 Amos, and all those people, mm -hmm. Daniel. There's no way to prove those people existed, or are they, are they put in, are they, were they real people but put in, Histori fictional stories well it's it could be the latter and with later characters like some of the kings of Israel like Jehoshaphat and uh, uh, 
Ahaz and uh, Om, Omri, another version of the name Omar, interestingly. Uh, these guys do seem to have existed, and they did have a kingdom called Israel. There are extra biblical monuments that show that, but these these great heroes and culture heroes and founders and all that, uh, there's the problem is that if you take away the temple, what have you got left to say about Solomon? He's the great builder and all of that. Uh, it's, if, if, there, if there weren't even enough people in, in the southern area to have a kingdom, what, is, what happens to the story of David uh, doing a census to see how many military men he can have? It, it just presupposes a much later anachronistic setting. Uh, so some will try to distill some vestige and say, well, maybe there was some sort of a bandit chief uh, that David was based on, which is exactly what they do with King Arthur. They say, well, maybe in the 6th century there was a Romano-British war chief named Arthur. Not that there's any real reason to think so. They're just saying it's like there must have been a Clark Kent. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it, it's uh, Niels Peter Lemke says these are just rationalizing paraphrases. They're trying to just give you a cloudy view of the story and, and get rid of all the stuff that is obviously mythic and say, well, maybe the rest of it's true. There's just no reason to do that. Uh, any document, as David Friedrich Strauss said, is as reliable as its most unreliable feature. Uh, that uh, if it's saying this kind of crazy thing, forget it. Uh, whatever else it says, incidentally, is not to be taken seriously either. Oh, okay, because Islam doesn't accept the Bible anyway, so hmm. I, don't, I don't have any problems criticizing the Bible. What about the people of the book thing, and that uh, Jesus brought the Injil, David, the Psalms? Uh, according to Islam, Jesus brought the Gospel, not the New Testament. But the Gospel is not the New Testament. The Gospel is some kind of revelation given to Jesus, not necessarily written. Uh -huh, yeah. not, not necessarily a written form, but maybe like an oral message or something hmm. like that. So that's the gospel of Jesus, but the gospel of Jesus is not the New Testament gospel mm -hmm. because the New Testament came, even the most conservative Christian apologists would say the New Testament came after Jesus. People wrote oh, down yes. the New Testament. Yeah. It just didn't fall out of the sky or whatever. Mm -hmm. Same thing with the Old Testament, uh, or sorry, same thing with the Torah. There was a Torah revealed to Moses. It wasn't written about Moses. Mm -hmm. same, same thing with the Injil or the Gospel. It was Injil. It was a Gospel revealed to Jesus, not written about uh -huh. Okay. So, so Islam kind of... Um, uh, has a different view on the Bible than, than like it's not like the Protestant version or the Catholic but doesn't the Protestant version have less books than the Catholic version yeah, the uh, most Christians after a while were Greek, uh, Greco-Roman, etc., and they read the Greek Old Testament, the Septuagint, which had more books in it. Um, but uh, the the Palestinian rabbis didn't accept the books that only existed in Greek, like Tobit, Judith, Maccabees, Sirach, Wisdom of Solomon, etc. Uh, and so, when since most Christians were Greek speakers, they just chose the Greek Bible. I Guess by default, really, and uh, then that was there were some rare people that thought they shouldn't have done it. Like I think Saint Jerome thought that really we ought to go with the ones that are just in Hebrew, though he didn't mind Greek ones. He translated the whole thing into Latin. Uh, but then uh, at the Protestant Reformation, Martin Luther also thought that these uh, these books that uh, in, that are only in the Septuagint. Well, he thought it better to go with the, the Palestinian Jewish, the rabbinic canon, and so he kicked out the, the other one. Well, actually, he didn't think there was much wrong with them. He just didn't think they were inspired scripture. Uh, he, the Bible, even Protestant, like the King James, until uh, I think it was 1823, contain the Apocrypha and uh, they just thought well this is edifying stuff but it's not the infallible word of God now Protestants just say oh, he needs it oh okay. 